Thomas and Beverly Ventura were cleaning up after their very successful 25th wedding anniversary party. It also coincidentally happened to be Bev's 44th birthday. From Thomas's point of view, it would be easier for him to remember both events, which are very important for a successful marriage if they happened on the same day. On the other hand, if he were to forget about these events, he would only be at risk of punishment once a year, rather than twice a year. They were both exhausted from planning and executing the celebration together, but were confident that the more than 50 people who attended, including their three children, had a great time. Strangely, Tom found himself feeling melancholy about this day. Lately, he's been having more and more days like this. He could not determine the reason for this. It just seemed to him that he no longer enjoyed anything as much as before. Sometimes he felt like he was in a fog. It was as if he was looking for something that was no longer there. Well, he thought, it's probably just age. During the party, Beverly seemed a little out of sorts to him. He brushed his thoughts aside and began the chore of cleaning. Tommy, do you think we could have a mature conversation today? Under normal circumstances, such a statement would cause serious concern to any reasonable husband. However, this did not cause Thomas undue concern. He immediately realized that Bev wanted to talk about something important. She wouldn't use that provocative opening line to tell him she put a dent in the car. Such dialogues took place two or three times a year. Of course, at the beginning of the marriage, they happened much more often. It was not easy for two people to navigate how to become one, which is what a successful long-term marriage required. While this usually meant that Bev was unhappy about something, not all the news was bad. Until now, in every case of their marriage, it all ended in fantastic makeup sex. That's because the rules of these so-called adult conversations were that no matter how angry or upset the spouse calling the meeting was, it had to take place in bed after all the children were asleep. Oh yes, and very importantly, they both must be naked and must not hide from each other under the covers. They had to be completely open to each other, and most importantly, they had to hug each other throughout the conversation. Personally, Tommy found it very difficult to be angry with his wife when he cradled her in his arms, her naked breasts pressed sensually against his chest. So far, this method has successfully resolved all conflicts in their marriage, and he wasn't worried that it wouldn't happen later in the evening. Since Tommy was on the receiving end, he was the one who decided whether to turn the light on the nightstand on or off. He usually chose one so he could see Bev's breasts rise and fall seductively as her passion for whatever was being discussed at the meeting increased. Today, for some reason, he chose turned off. This turned out to be a prophetic choice on his part. Tommy, our last child just graduated from high school and is about to leave for college. Well, I'm not sure going off to college is the right way to describe it, Bev, Tommy interrupted. I mean, Paris and Franklin going to a state college 15 minutes from our house doesn't really qualify? You know what I mean. He smiled in the darkness. Yes, honey, I understand what you're talking about. Although they still live with us, it is as if we are turning the page, opening a new chapter in our lives. Bev quickly stood up and kissed Tommy hard on the lips. At the same time, she tried to let her hardened buds slide lightly over his chest as she kissed Tommy. Bev knew it was driving him crazy. I'm so glad that you understand and feel this too. This makes what I have to tell you so much easier. With those words, and better late than never, alarm bells started ringing in Tommy's head. He was glad that he decided to turn off the light. He didn't want his face to give her away. My soul, as you know, I have been out of sorts for a long time, and our love has matured to such a degree that I think you'll understand where I'm going with this. I mean, there are new things I want to experience. Just tell me what's on your mind, Bev, he said warily. Okay. I want to have a different experience. Before we get too old, the kids don't need me like they used to. For God's sake, Bev, spit it out. He said it much louder than he intended. He quickly came to his senses and remembered that none of the children spent the night at home and did not hear his outburst. Hmm, interesting. I want to have a different relationship, expand my horizons, so to speak. 
Tommy was 99% sure where this conversation would lead, but he wasn't about to let her off the hook. Please, Bev, just tell me what you want. No more euphemisms, no more delays. Just say it. Thomas has always been the more level-headed of the two. He was not prone to whims or panic in tense situations. He was riding on an even keel, as he called it. He did not become arrogant when everything went his way, and did not lose heart when everything went against him. As a logistics engineer, he was process-oriented both at work and at home. Beverly, on the other hand, was the more free-spirited of them. She was prone to flights of fancy and did not hide her emotions. She worked for a marketing company, so her personality suited her calling. Having two different personality types always helped their relationship. The weakness of one partner was the strength of the other. He was confident that in the coming weeks, this symbiosis would be seriously tested. Beverly climbed on top of Thomas, settling on his manhood from the waist down. He was sure she was hoping her friend would lighten the mood so she could control what happened next. But Bev was disappointed. If it weren't so dark and she could see Tommy's expression, she might not have continued. You know what I want to say, Tommy. Don't play games with me, honey. It is very important for me. But I want you to know that I would never do anything like that. I would never change the dynamic of our relationship without your understanding and approval. We've been a team all our lives, and this is no different from what it was before. Everything was seething inside him, but he maintained outward calm. He slipped into his work self. This conversation will not continue until you tell me clearly and directly what you want, Beverly. Tommy, you know what I'm asking. Please believe me. I can't tell you. Tom, with some effort, tore Bev away from him and tried to stand up. Okay, Tommy. Don't go. I want to have a relationship. Tommy started to stand up again. She hugged him tighter. Tommy, I've never had anyone but you. So yes, sex is part of it, but I want to have relationships with other men while I'm still young enough to enjoy it. At this point, most husbands would be outraged. There would have been screaming and yelling, but Tommy was smarter. Tell me why this is so important to you. She hesitated. Come on, Bev. I know you are impulsive, but you are a smart and professional woman. You didn't come to that conclusion at dinner today. You didn't see the handsome young man who walked past you the other day and said to himself, I have to get him. So, I need your thoughts on how you came to this important decision. Before I can give you my thoughts, now it was Beverly's turn to be surprised. Tommy had a strange look in his eyes as he spoke. In the darkness, Beverly couldn't see him, even though she was right above him. She expected screams and screams, so the children were not at home. Besides, it bothered her a little that Tommy was right. She had been thinking about this for months. She even discussed with her best friend Simmy several times how she should broach the subject with Tommy. Simmy told her that she was crazy for deciding to talk to her husband about this. She warned her that she needed to cheat secretly and never say a word about it to Tommy. Bev thought briefly about Simmy's proposal, but she couldn't do that to Tommy. Dear, today I turned 44 years old. You know I'm an eternal optimist, but even I have to admit that more than half of my life is probably behind me. I really feel the need to have emotional relationships with other people. I know it's selfish of me, but I feel a strong need for it. She paused, expecting Tommy to say something at that moment, but he was silent. We are doing great in our relationship and raising our children together. At that moment, she lowered herself onto Tommy's arm again and threw her leg over his in the usual position. When he didn't push her away, she continued, I am not stupid. I know this will hurt you, but you need to know how much I love you. I know we can get through this together. She paused, waiting for him to interrupt, but again he didn't. Beverly was slightly embarrassed, but at the same time felt more confident. It should be a two-way conversation. Tommy, darling, tell me what you think. I promise I won't do this without your consent. For now, we're just talking. However, Tommy was not going to give in to persuasion. He still couldn't think of anything to say without sounding like a victim, or worse, a petulant child. Not until she fully explains herself. To be honest, Bev, your reasoning seems rather superficial so far. Please continue. 
he said curtly. I assure you, honey, it's not about you or even about a physical need. This is purely selfish and emotional self-indulgence on my part. She paused again, and he continued to remain silent. I think it comes down to the fact that I don't want to leave anything on the table. Oh, crap, I'm explaining it wrong. She sighed and hugged him tighter. She even started shedding real tears. In her mind, it was something she desperately needed to validate her self-worth as a woman. At the same time, she understood that this would cause Tommy great pain, and she loved him very much. Maybe she should just forget about all this. Even to her, it sounded childish. I know I'm hurting you a lot, Tommy, and I really didn't mean to. Her tears fell freely onto his chest. You know, I think I really understand your position, Beverly. I wish you could give me more, but I don't think that's necessary right now. Maybe sometime in the future, after you've thought it through, we can talk more about this. You are too thoughtful a person not to think about the consequences. Bev heard something different in his voice. She wasn't sure what it was. Maybe resign. I swear, Tommy, it kills me that I'm hurting you like this. But I hope you understand that I didn't mean to. And know that I will make amends to you. You've given me an awful lot to think about, Bev. I'm going to bed. I suddenly felt very tired. But Tommy, I thought maybe we could... Not today, Bev. These were words that neither of them had ever spoken before. He pulled away from her. I'm sorry, Tommy, she whispered. Her tears grew stronger. She truly loved him, and she knew she had hurt him. Bev was a little surprised that he didn't fight back, or at least show more emotion. She kissed him tenderly on the cheek and lay down with a sigh. Beverly was very happy that their conversation went so well, but maybe she was missing something. She loved Tommy with all her heart. She was already thinking about how she would continually show him her love as her journey progressed. His understanding was of great importance to her. Wait a minute, what did he say about the consequences? Reality slowly returned to her mind. Tommy, what did you mean when you said consequences? I said I was aware that I was causing pain. We'll talk about this in the morning, Beverly. Good night. Beverly tossed and turned incessantly. She hardly slept at all. Overnight, her worldview changed dramatically. Not long ago, she had been so clear and confident in herself, but now she was tormented by doubts. Something was wrong here. She could clearly hear Tommy's slow, rhythmic breathing. He seemed to quickly fall into a deep and restful sleep. If he was in so much pain, how could he do such a thing? Men are such strange creatures. In the end, she too fell into an uneasy sleep. She woke up with a start and quickly sat up, finding that Tommy was not next to her. She looked at the clock on the nightstand. They showed 6.30. Tommy should be downstairs making coffee. When the cobwebs cleared from her head, she heard him moving noisily around the kitchen. Sighing with relief, she sank onto the pillow and plunged into thought for several minutes. Bev knew what she had to do. She jumped up, threw on her robe, and rushed to the kitchen. She started to tie her robe because she was still naked underneath, but decided not to. She needed some serious ass-kissing here. Being naked did nothing to hinder her efforts. Tommy, darling, good morning, she exclaimed joyfully. Please forgive me for my madness yesterday. Can we just chalk this up to the ramblings of a middle-aged housewife who is terrified of her approaching old age? She continued walking towards him. She hesitantly reached towards him. He allowed himself to be hugged. Bev's robe fell open, just as she had expected. She thought she still looked pretty good for an old maid. Thomas hugged her back and allowed his eyes to take in her busty and luxurious figure. She smiled knowingly. However, Bev noticed that something was missing. His hugs seemed somehow different, maybe even detached. She had a lot of work ahead of her, but she wasn't going to stop. She had to fix the situation with the man she loved more than life itself. Tommy quickly and silently returned to his daily duty of serving the two of them. Bev looked at her husband in bewilderment for a moment. She reminded him, I'm serious, Tommy. Forget everything I said last night. Really, honey, it was just stupidity on my part. Thomas was silent, standing with his back to Beverly, who was sitting. Sitting down in the chair, Bev made sure her robe was wide open. Tommy was still uncommunicative. 
When the coffee machine finally finished its brewing cycle, he carefully poured two mugs. He gets it black, and she gets it with one teaspoon of sugar, as always. He turned carefully. At the sight of Bev naked, he stopped briefly, but his face remained an indifferent mask. He sat down slowly and carefully pushed the coffee towards her. It's not that simple, Bev. How can I just forget what you said? Besides, as I told you last night, you must have been thinking about this for months before you approached me. Knowing you, you even discussed it with a few of your friends before telling me. Beverly blushed and lowered her head, suddenly engrossed in the contents of her mug. No, Bev. I'll have to think about this a lot more. Your nakedness and apologies will not take away my pain. Bev was shocked. She reflexively pulled her robe closed, clenching it in her fist. What to think about here? I told you I'm sorry. Out of surprise, her answer sounded much harsher than she intended. She suddenly realized how depressed Tommy looked. Thomas stood up. I'm going to work, Bev. Tommy, today is Sunday. Y you're not serious, are you? A cold chill ran through her. Tommy, please? But he was already outside the door. Bev slammed her hand down on the table, causing her coffee to fly out of her overturned mug, which clattered to the floor and shattered on impact. You are a stupid, stupid woman. What have you done? Beverly lowered her head onto her folded arms and sobbed pitifully. He returned home very late. Beverly lay in bed and pretended to sleep. She heard him move. She hoped he would climb into bed soon. But he never came to their bedroom. She heard him go into the spare bedroom of their five-room house. She couldn't stop crying. For the next few days, they tiptoed around each other. Every time she tried to bring up the elephant in the room, Tommy would simply get up and walk away. Not now, Bev. That was his only answer. When Beverly returned home from work on Friday, she saw Tommy's car already in the garage. She hoped this was a good sign. This was not the case. Bev was full of hope when she entered the house. She immediately saw a sullen Tommy sitting at the kitchen table. He looked up at her with dead eyes and held out the envelope lying in front of him towards her. He couldn't even look her in the eyes. She looked at the envelope in bewilderment, then at Tom, then back and forth several times. In about three seconds, she went from a paralyzed state of shock to outrage. Never! We won't get divorced. Are you crazy? Are you going to divorce me? Twenty-five years down the drain because I had one moment of madness. This will never happen, mister. She scattered the papers on the floor with one angry wave of her hand and, angrily stomping, went into the bedroom. I have never cheated on you, Thomas Ventura. Tom remained expressionless. His face was an unreadable blank sheet. He flinched slightly when Bev slammed the bedroom door. He quietly rose from his chair. Picking up his already packed suitcase, he silently left the house for what seemed to him to be the last time. He had only made it two blocks to his motel room when his cell phone started ringing via Bluetooth. He answered without hesitation. You are a goddamned coward. You're a fucking piece of shit. Listen to my words, Tommy, screamed the hysterical Beverly. We are not getting divorced. I will never agree to this. I will fight this to the last penny. We'll both be penniless and on the street before I give you a divorce. You damn coward. Her squealing, interspersed with wailing and sobbing, continued for several minutes. Tommy continued to drive. He waited patiently for Beverly to calm down. He realized that she was already close to this when she began to have hiccups, which often happened under strong emotional stress. Finally, there was silence for a few moments. She uttered her last desperate words. Her voice was almost a whisper of a plea filled with sadness. Tommy, you love me. I know you love me. He knew he would always love her to some extent, but he sighed before answering. Bev, our marriage ended the moment you told me you wanted to have sex with other men. Without waiting for an answer, he disconnected the call. A subsequent meeting, or rather an attempt at intervention by the children a few weeks later, failed to convince him to remain married to their mother. However, they at least got him to agree to see a marriage counselor. He capitulated, if only so that they would stop pursuing and pestering him. He made a deal with them. He will go, but they will never try to interfere with their parents' relationship again. If they do this, 
their connection with him will be broken forever. Thomas and Beverly agreed to meet with Dr. Tennell Adams, a doctor of psychology and licensed marriage and family therapist, who was listed as approved by the family court. Dr. Adams was dressed professionally, and her appearance and manner were somewhat formal. At the first session, she clearly defined the schedule and ground rules. Dr. Adams noted that during their first few sessions together, Beverly became emotional and expressed genuine regret about the current state of their marriage. She also took responsibility for her role in its destruction. She really insisted that Tommy was being stubborn and unreasonable. It was just one conversation. She stated in no uncertain terms that she had never cheated or even done anything that would not pass the husband test. On the other hand, Thomas was much more difficult for her to understand. He seemed to be listening, but he seemed distant. When Beverly spoke, he concentrated on what he was saying. It seemed like he was looking for something specific. But Tom never asked questions during the sessions. This seemed strange to Dr. Adams. At the beginning of their fourth session, after Beverly once again deeply apologized and stated her sincere desire to correct what she had done so that they could move on, Thomas unexpectedly interrupted her. You're wrong, Bev. You can't fix it. You can't fix it because it's not all your fault. It took both Bev and Dr. Adams by surprise. It's also my fault. Oh, I admit that when you first brought it up, I was furious. Angier than I ever remembered. I guess I was in shock. It took me a few days to come to my senses about what you did to me. I think, doctor, you would call it my fragile male ego, which is incapable of rational thought. That's why I was so detached during this period. Once my initial rage had subsided, I needed to think things through. Both Bev and Dr. Adams looked puzzled. Make no mistake, I was offended by your request, but not for the reason you probably thought. I was outraged that you had the courage to do what I didn't. I wasn't angry with you. I was angry with myself. Tommy, what are you saying? At this point, Dr. Adams intervened in the conversation. Yes, Thomas, you must make this clear. Why are you so angry with yourself? She had a sinking feeling that she already knew the answer, but it had to be said anyway. Dr. Adams didn't like to call herself a marriage and family counselor. She was a relationship consultant. She could not give advice if she did not know the essence of the problem. She was almost sure that she would soon find out the answer to this question. Tommy looked at his soon-to-be ex with a feeling of real compassion. He hoped that when this nightmare was over, they would be able to maintain friendly relations. He was conflicted. If he tells the truth, it may not be possible. Because, Bev, I felt the same way. He closed his eyes for a moment to collect his thoughts. When he opened them again, he looked straight into Bev's eyes. I just didn't have the heart to say it like you did. I knew that something had been missing in our lives for a long time. Maybe it's because the kids left. Or maybe we just spent so much time on our careers and raising our families that we lost each other. It's hard for me to articulate this. I think I just felt numb most of the time. But I didn't know why. Bev's breath caught in recognition. She involuntarily nodded her head in agreement. Oh, I didn't necessarily want to have sex with other women. But then it dawned on me that your desire to have sex with others was not a selfish, abstract whim. You were looking for the intimacy that was between us before. It was a revelation for me. This, uh, clarified my own situation for me. If that makes sense, rather you were trying to find something that we lost long ago. I believe you are trying to light a spark. We were once very good together, before we focused on children. They both smiled, fondly remembering the time that had passed. I gave up living in the quiet and boring routine that our marriage had become. I felt like I was indebted to you. You have been so good to me and such a wonderful mother to our children. I guess I believed that this was the best thing that could happen in my life. I felt that, well, I thought that out of loyalty, I would stay. When you said those words to me, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Upon reflection, I realized that you feel the same way as me. And then I made a decision. But Tommy, you never said anything. 
That's because I'm not as brave as you. At least until then. You made me take a good, long, hard look at myself as well as our marriage. I'm not sure I agree with you. Well, Bev, if you want to argue about this, would you like to strip naked and hug each other like we did before when we argued? Dr. Adams appears to be an avant-garde and creative consultant. But even she can have trouble with that. Thomas's eyes sparkled as he spoke. Dr. Adams remained expressionless. Tell me this, Bev. What word would you use to describe our marriage? Well, I would... I mean, I would have to think... No, you wouldn't do that. You already know the answer. We've both said this many times when asked about it. They said it together, with a feeling of awareness and sadness. Comfortable. They were silent for several minutes. At that moment, Beverly realized that her marriage was truly over. And it has been like this for a long time. Love didn't matter anymore. The saying that love conquers all was complete nonsense. It's a good line in movies, on greeting cards, and in trashy novels. But that's about it. The daily trials and tribulations of real life, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, have surpassed the ideal of love. But this does not mean that there was no love. It was just the daily difficulties and hardships of real life that made it irrelevant. But Tommy, our marriage was not a mistake. The sex was still good, not the same as when we first met, but still good. It's not that we hate each other. No, it wasn't a mistake, but that doesn't mean we should stay married. And yes, the sex was good. But we haven't made love in years, Bev. You know it's true. Beverly wanted to object, but Tommy raised his hand. I'm not attacking you, Bev. I told you I understand, and I meant it. Let's stop fighting while we still love each other. Let's start looking for something new and interesting. It's about time, Bev. At this point, Dr. Adams intervened. Out of professional curiosity, Thomas, if you think so, why didn't you just agree to Beverly's proposal? Perhaps you would be willing to open your marriage to others? She gave you many opportunities to amend your proposal. What's the point, doctor? Besides, do you know much more than I do about the success of so-called open marriages? The doctor gave him a look full of satisfaction the kind a teacher gives to a star student after solving a difficult problem. As I understand it, our marriage is over. It was all over. Turning around with other people, dating, all that nonsense, would only delay the inevitable. He paused to collect his thoughts. And by doing something like that, we might end up hating each other, he said with disgust. I thought it was better to cut the umbilical cord, get it over with right away. Yes, Thomas, I know. The doctor intervened again. You're right. It's a very bad strategy to try to save a problematic relationship. But I believe what Beverly is saying is that you never discussed this together. To her, it looks like you're just giving up on your marriage without putting up a fight. She paused thoughtfully, waiting for his answer. I thought about it. I think what worried me was that if I shared my thoughts, well, maybe Bev would try to stay like me, out of a sense of duty to me. She was already giving up her desire for change within minutes of plucking up the courage to speak her mind. This requires great courage. If that happened, we would be back where we were. Most likely, over time, we would quietly hate each other. I'm sure you've had many sessions with older married couples who are constantly angry at each other for no real reason. The doctor nodded again as a sign of understanding. Think about it, Bev. We haven't done anything together for the past few years, just the two of us, like it was before the children were born. We come home from work tired. We eat dinner together, mostly in silence. We're not talking about anything serious, as usual. How's your work? Or about what happens to children. When we finish, we go to our rooms to do our own thing. We have different friends, interests, and hobbies. We really don't exist anymore. From my point of view, I didn't want to become one of those old people who sit in cafes all day long because they can't bear to sit at home with their wife. I've seen and heard them before. All they do is whine about their life, their wife, and how the world has turned to shit. 
They constantly criticize those whose lives are different because, in their opinion, everyone should be as unhappy as themselves. But in reality, all they do is sit and wait for death. Tom felt embarrassed for his words, but the doctor just smiled at him and he continued, We both deserve better, Bev. For that matter, so do our children. I know that I could and should have responded more adequately to your cry for help, but at that moment it seemed to me that I just needed to rip the bandage off an open wound. Their amicable divorce was finalized nine months later. They agreed that Beverly would stay in the house with the children until they graduated from college. They will then split the proceeds from its sale 50-50, just like everything else. When Thomas received the final court decision in the mail, he drove from his tiny apartment near his work to his old house. As expected, he found a gloomy Beverly in the living room, surrounded by children sitting gloomily at the table. She was clearly crying. When he entered the house, all four pairs of eyes turned to him. I'm sorry. Perhaps you should have knocked. He pointed his thumb towards the door. You'll have to get used to this. Don't be funny, Tommy. It's still your home. Beverly waved her hand, driving away his thoughts. So you got your copy, too. Tommy calmly stated the obvious. Bev nodded silently. I just... Uh, I mean, I wanted to make sure you were okay, you know? She nodded again and began to cry quietly. Tommy, I didn't cry because I thought what we were doing was wrong. I cried for what we lost many years ago, and I thought about what we could do differently to avoid this. He smiled thinly. I understand, Bev. I had the same thoughts. We were just talking about dinner. Why don't you stay and share it with us? Bev snorted. We can all be miserable together. He agreed. What the hell? He had nothing better to do. Over the next few months, this became a regular family event on Wednesday evenings. If any of them were aware of the irony that they had never done this before, no one spoke about it. Tom eventually returned home and began gardening and farming several days a week, as he always did. Pretty soon, Bev was doing his laundry for him, just like she always did. She even went grocery shopping so that his refrigerator and pantry would have something other than beer and a cup of noodles. For the most part, Wednesday dinners were spent talking lightly and casually about what was going on in the children's lives. However, over time, Tom and Bev began to try to spend some quiet time together after dinner while their children were doing homework or working on other projects. On one of these evenings, Beverly noticed that Tom was a little silent, and their routine work of washing dishes that evening took place mostly in silence. She asked carefully, Are you all right, Tommy? He sighed slightly, turned off the tap and turned to face her, drying his hands on a towel and leaning back against the counter. I don't really like looking back, Bev, but yesterday I thought that I never gave you the chance to tell me why. Even during our consultations, maybe it doesn't matter anymore, but it bothers me. He wrinkled his brow. Actually, this is not entirely true. It's not so much about the why as it is about the what. What did you think would happen when you confronted me with your need? I guess that's what you could call it. Wow, Tommy, there's so much. You don't have to tell me, he quickly intervened. I mean, you don't owe me anything or anything. No, I want to tell you, Tommy. I guess I really owe you one. She thought for a moment before continuing. I never told you, but I saw Dr. Adams alone a few more times after we agreed to divorce. We talked a lot about this, and there are some things that I don't quite understand even to this day. But one thing I can say for sure, I didn't expect what happened, Ed, that's for sure. They both had a good laugh about it. However, over time, and especially during consultations, I gradually came to understand that your decision was truly the best for all of us, including children. Bev studied Tom's expression carefully. Please do not be angry. I'll tell you the truth, but maybe some of it will hurt. I know, but I really need to understand, if only for my own peace of mind. Fine. First of all, you were right. I thought about this for a long time. Almost a year, if you can believe it. Besides, I was honest when I told you that this was a discussion. I wasn't trying to shove anything down your throat. I would never have done this if you had refused. Now it sounds corny and self-serving, I know, 
but it's true nonetheless. I thought there were three scenarios that could happen if I talked about it. But I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you that there was a part of me that thought and hoped that you would let me do this. A shocked expression immediately appeared on Tom's face. I know, Tommy, I know. She held out her palms to him so that he would not interrupt her flow. But then I thought I could convince you that it wouldn't hurt us. It was only much later, in a conversation with Dr. Adams, that she convinced me that if you agreed, only two things could happen. And in both cases, our marriage would have ended anyway. In one case, I would lose all respect for you for allowing it. And in the second, you would lose all respect for me for doing it. In any case, we would have divorced. At this point, Beverly became emotional. Of course, when I came up with this plan, the second option that I really hoped for was that you would scream at me. And then, in the end, we would go to counseling, where we would work everything out and save our marriage. When you didn't, you really threw me off balance. That's when I lost control of the argument, and that's why I attacked you when you handed me the papers. She was silent for a long time. What about the third option? He whispered to her barely audibly. Bev laughed bitterly and caustically. I thought that in the worst-case scenario, we would end up in some kind of open marriage. Dr. Adams gave me some statistics on this. Suffice it to say that our marriage would have been over if any of the three options had come true. I believe a marriage truly ends when one party believes that their selfish need is the most important part of the relationship, right? In the end, you were right. Our marriage fell apart as soon as these words came out of my mouth. She began to cry quietly. Tom hugged her and let her talk. Listen, Bev, I don't blame you for ruining our marriage. It took us both. You may have lit the fuse, but sooner or later it was bound to happen anyway. He thanked her and quietly left. On the way home, he couldn't decide whether he felt vindicated or like a jerk for putting Beverly through this. Be that as it may, family dinners on Wednesdays continued. If Tom and Bev noticed it, they never admitted it, but Paris, Franklin, and Tracy constantly joked that after their divorce, their parents acted as if they were married. From that moment on, Beverly and Tom never discussed the past again. Instead, they focused on what was going on in each other's lives. The conversation invariably turned to personal experience. When asked, Tommy was reluctant to tell Bev about several unsuccessful dates. He told her it made him very shy. The first attempt was a blind date to which his work friends took him. She was a very nice woman. However, she immediately told him that she was looking for a man who would marry her and help raise her three teenagers. She talked about marriage like a business deal. It was an unfortunate start to his single life. The second attempt at a date was with a recently divorced woman like him, and she interrogated him as if she were a prosecutor in a murder trial. Tommy was sure that this woman mistook him for a criminal. There was no second date either. After that, Tommy said that he would refrain from making new acquaintances for now. Beverly didn't go on any real dates, but she did have coffee with a few guys from work. She tried going to bachelorette parties a few times, but told Tommy that it depressed her. Her girlfriends, single, married, and divorced, dragged her to famous pickup spots. It seemed to Beverly that everyone there was too desperate. They were trying so hard to have a good time that it seemed cynical. This bothered her greatly. The third time she went out with the girls, two married women started making out with guys at the bar. One of them, a work colleague, actually left with one of the lizards. Beverly was shocked. Another married girl, doing the kissing Tammy, noticed Bev's disapproving look and commented, Relax, Miss Goody Two-Shoes. What our husbands don't know won't hurt them. Besides, we deserve to take a break from life in our boring world of being a wife and mother every now and then. Without thinking, Bev snapped, I could never do something like that with my husband. Yes, and look what it got you to. How stupid could you be? Tell your husband that you are going to change. What the hell were you thinking? The moment she told Tommy her story, she broke down. He walked over to her and hugged at her, trying to comfort her. Bev, listen to me. From my point of view, you did the right thing. Neither of you liked who we were becoming. Honestly, I think we get along better with each other now that we're divorced. There is no law anywhere that says you have to wait until you hate each other before breaking up. 
The following Wednesday at dinner, as Tommy entered the house, his three children rushed at him. They pressed him against the doorframe as they rushed past him. As they flew past, they giggled and shouted something goodbye. What the hell? was all he managed to say before he heard Bev calling him from the dining room. The last thing he heard from his children was Franklin laughing, telling him not to get hurt. He headed towards the dining room, shaking his head in confusion. The house was filled with the divine aroma of his favorite dish, meatloaf. He inhaled deeply through his nose to savor the scent. As soon as he did this, he realized how hungry he was. Hey, Bev, what the... His ex-wife stood in front of him, naked as the day she was born. Well, except for the three-inch black CFMs and matching fishnet stockings that hug her creamy thighs. Her lips were painted ruby red, as were her nails. There was one red carnation in her hair. The finishing touch was simple pearl beads around the neck. Leaning forward to get a better look at her, Tommy took a double shot. A neat stencil written in cursive black ink read, Tommy on Bev's freshly waxed smooth alabaster pubis. Is this forever? Thought the stunned ex-husband. Beverly stood in a pose with one hand on her hip and the other holding a delicious smelling meatloaf high. Behind her was a festive table setting for a candlelit dinner. White tablecloth, red roses in a crystal vase and everything else. He froze in place, his eyes bulging from their sockets. Tommy's mouth moved, but nothing came out. He felt excitement where he had not felt for a long time. Don't be afraid, Tommy. I'm not talking about till death do us part or anything like that. I just swore to myself that I would become something new and exciting for you or die trying. Bev purred in a guttural voice full of lust. Maybe if I had done something like this a long time ago, we wouldn't be where we are now. There's no point in looking back, Bev. Are we going to eat this meatloaf, or are you just going to stand there and hold it? Softly, Tom. Very softly. You know, come to think of it, we can always warm it up later. He practically ran towards her. No sooner had Tom and Bev's three children climbed into the car than they heard their mother squealing and laughing like a teenager. They stopped and turned around, stunned by what was about to happen in the only house they had ever lived in. Standing in shock, Franklin thought, if I live to be a hundred, I will never be able to forget what my mother looks like. I'll probably be in treatment for years. Paris, you are the brains of this team, he said. How many parental pairs do you think there are on this planet? He asked a question. I don't know, Franklin. Well, let's say there are about eight billion people on Earth. So what, maybe more than half a billion? Franklin and Tracy nodded their heads thoughtfully. This is a big number. What is the probability that ours will be the strangest in the world? Tracy said, clearly confused. Amazing, isn't it? Paris laughed. At that moment, all three heard their loving, caring, angelic mother scream from inside the house. Oh my God, Tommy. Yes, this is so amazing. Yes, therapy is definitely in my future. Franklin shook his head and wondered if he would ever be normal again. Do you think they will get married again? Tracy asked. Paris said thoughtfully, I doubt. They're having too much fun right now to risk ruining everything. She clapped her hands loudly twice to attract the attention of her younger brothers and sisters. Okay, let's go eat pizza and try to forget that we even saw or heard anything. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.